Good evening, I'm Stacia Peroni, the Conservation Manager at the Kansas City Zoo, and I wanna thank you for joining us during this early celebration of Earth Day, which is actually happening on Thursday. Um, I'm proud to lead the zoo's conservation efforts to preserve our planet, and especially its wildlife. Uh, through the Zoo's Conservation Fund, we're able to invest more than $300,000 each year in projects at home and around the globe that are making a difference in helping save animals. Um, I'm really excited that I'm being joined tonight by Jeff York. Jeff, who is the Senior Director of Conservation with Polar Bears International, Jeff has more than 20 years of Arctic field experience including 14 consecutive years of polar bear capture and handling efforts in the uh, Chucky and Southern Beaufort Seas. Prior to joining Polar Bears International, he was the Arctic Species and Polar Bear Lead for the World Wildlife Fund's Global Arctic Program. Jeff is a member of the Polar Bear Specialist Group of the International Union of Conservation of Nature, the U.S. Polar Bear Recovery Team, a past chair and active member of the Polar Bear Range States Conflict Working Group. Welcome, Jeff. So I'm going to tell you Thanks, just Patrick. a little. Hi, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit more about Polar Bears International really quick, and then I'm going to hand it off to Jeff to take the show over. Um, so Polar Bears International is the only conservation organization solely dedicated to wild polar bears. Uh, through their research and education and advocacy, they work to inspire people to care about the Arctic and its connection to our global climate. I'm excited for you to join us tonight and learn more about leading polar bear research and the important project that the Kansas City Zoo supports, the Polar Bears International Burr on the Fur Project. Uh, just to, before we get started, a quick reminder, um, anyone, we're going live using StreamYard, so anyone joining us from Facebook, before leaving a comment if you in the chat box, if you allow StreamYard access to see your name, we can actually see who we're talking to tonight. Um, other than that, Jeff, we're ready to hear from you. Okay, Let's see if our technology works here. So as Stasia said, my name is Jeff York and I'm the Senior Director of Conservation at Polar Bears International. I have spent a lot of time out on the sea ice. I feel super fortunate to have had the opportunities to go out and be with polar bears where they live, which is on the sea ice for most parts of their life. Most recently, I was able to spend some time in Arctic Russia, specifically on Wrangell Island, uh, where I spent a couple of months working with Dr. Eric Regeer at the University of Washington to do a ground-based survey of polar bears on the island. So we drove around on ATVs, as you can see here, and counted every bear. And we counted well over 200 visually and estimated that there were well over 1,000 on the island with us. We encountered polar bears close up on the ground every day. So the mission of Polar Bears International is to keep polar bears in the Arctic forever. Polar bears are built for the cold environment which they live in. They spend, again, most of their lives out on the sea ice habitat, out on the sea ice substrate. They've developed thick fat, heavy fur, and sharp claws to help them survive and thrive in what seems to us a fairly hostile environment. They are really masters of, of that historically cold part of the world in the Arctic, and they are the top predator, at least historically. But times are changing and temperatures are warming. To give you an idea of some of these adaptations in action, this is a really short video clip that'll show you a polar bear. And this is in Svalbard, Norway, closing in on a seal, or it might not. <laughs> Here we go. And as far as we know, this is one of the few uh, video captures of a bear successfully catching a seal. They're not long distance runners, but they can sprint very quickly over a short distance. And you see that in action in that video concept there. Polar bears, again, are only in the Arctic for management purposes. We group them in 19 subpopulations. These different boxes represent 
those subpopulations and give you an idea by color how they're doing, red, green, yellow, red being more poorly, green being better. We know across the Arctic um, where we have good long-term monitoring data in places like the Southern Beaufort Sea and places like Western Hudson Bay and Southern Hudson Bay in Canada, we've seen some pretty dramatic declines in populations up to 30% in recent years. And that's why polar bears are threatened as, or listed as vulnerable with the IUCN red list. The Arctic is warming two to three times faster than the rest of the planet. That warming is causing the sea ice that polar bears literally use for their traveling, for hunting, for breeding, and in some cases for denning to melt and to melt quite quickly. The changes that we're seeing in both sea ice extent and sea ice volume are having direct impacts on polar bear populations. They're having direct impacts on cub survival and in some areas on survival of adults. At Polar Bears International, we're trying to address that primary threat of climate change largely through outreach and education. We're trying to bring people around the world to the Arctic to Polar Bear's home. And here you see us broadcasting from a tundra buggy in Churchill, Canada. These outreach efforts also involve working with media, working with documentary film crews, and most importantly, working with our Arctic Ambassador Center partners like the Kansas City Zoo to do outreach at zoos across North America and in Europe. I think as most of you know, zoos see more people in North America than attend professional sporting events um, combined. It's a huge number of people that go to zoos, take their kids to zoos, take their grandkids, their niece and nephew. It's a fantastic audience to reach out to and we couldn't do it without our partners. We're also active supporting research or doing research in four of the five polar bear range states. We have den monitoring work in Svalbard, Norway, we support population monitoring in Hudson Bay and are testing new technology to look at conflict. And we're working in Alaska and on Wrangell Island. One particular aspect of polar bears that we're focusing in on for this talk is how do we know what they're doing? How are we able to, to see them when they're way out on the sea ice far from view? The more we know about polar bear movements, the more we know about how they use sea ice habitat or land habitat, which they're using more and more across the Arctic as sea ice melts earlier and more bears spend longer times on shore. The better we can understand what management needs polar bears have uh, for those different habitat types. When is sea ice most important? How long are they staying on land and in what areas? What areas should be protected from certain human activities? Where are polar bears denning? And how can we protect those critical areas to make sure we have strong populations entering this time of drastic change? So I wanna share with you a quick video that talks about this exciting new project we started with 3M and that now we're reaching out to our zoo partners to help us complete. Polar bears are one of the most difficult animals to tag and track given where they live. Bears are, are tough, they're rough and tumble. Males are sparring with each other. And so keeping things attached to bears is particularly hard. So we're often asked, why do you tag and track polar bears or wildlife in general? Tracking gives us a ton of information on habitat use, where animals go and what they're doing when we can't see them. An animal like a polar bear, most of their life history occurs out of sight. They live in very remote places out on the sea ice where it's quite difficult to get to and nearly impossible to get to in the dark winter months. Having devices that remotely give us information on what a polar bear or other wildlife might be doing is incredibly valuable. The challenge came to us through my son. My son works for Polar Bears International and um, he reached out to me one day and he's going, Dad, we have a problem, we need to attach a tag to a polar bear. You work for a company that makes things stick. 
can you help us make a tag stick to a bear? Recently, tags and transmitters for bear research or research in general on animals have been shrunk down. They're quite small now. We really need a better tool in order to attach these to the animal itself. Polar Bears International is working with 3M to work and look at, you know, is there better adhesives, uh, maybe some sort of uh, Velcro-like tool, or maybe a tape that could adhere this to the animal for a short amount of time. And then when the tag has outlived itself, the adhesive will simply let go and the tag will be released from the animal. From there, I turned around and went to our tech forum community. I said, can we figure out a way to do this? I put together a, an event we called the Tag a Bear Challenge. It was a creative event to invite people for the couple of days to brainstorm and come up with some solutions. Here's a polar bear pelt. This is when they molt. This is how long we need this little tag to stick to the bear. Now, what can you guys do? And then from there, we went into solving those problems, developing test methodologies. And it's been about a two-year process. Over that time, we came up with several solutions and we've reduced it down to essentially four methodologies. Some of them are adhesive methodologies, some are mechanical methodologies, and some are hybrids of both of those. Everything we know right now about polar bears is from adult female movements. So we're missing a big chunk of the information on how other bears use habitat, how other bears move around in the subpopulation and potentially between subpopulations. So if we're successful in testing these fur tags, if they work on polar bears, it will allow us for the first time to track adult male polar bears and subadult polar bears. These tags could potentially go on bears of any size. So this will give us a lot more information on polar bear life history, and it'll really round out what we know about polar bear habitat use and how things are changing as sea ice continues to melt. This has really been a demonstration of the best of 3M. It's what has been really exciting for me about my career here. It's a challenge that I put out to the technical community and there are a group of folks that have embraced this and have helped to come up with solutions and are just as excited about it as I am. The intent is to provide the wildlife community with a platform for attaching tags, radio tags to these animals and be able to track them. Arctic and polar bears provide for some really interesting challenges and unanswered questions. I'm excited to look for new ways to use this tool to try to fill in some of the gaps and provide answers to some of those questions. Thanks for queuing up the video. So next steps for this are to get it on bears in the wild and bears in captivity. We were fortunate this fall to have a chance in Western Hudson Bay to get out five prototype tags of two different types. Um, one of those tag types failed quickly, which was actually a great um, outcome uh, because we were able to just figure out what happened there and the other ones worked through the end of the year they were deployed on wild bears november 13th and they tracked through the end of 2020 which gave us some some really good information what we lack in the wild though is we don't know what happens when these tags fail are bears rubbing them off are they encountering things that scrape them off are they just falling off are they just literally failing and so that's where our captive partners come in uh, partners like the kansas city zoo where we can deploy one of these non-invasive fur tags on a bear where it can be monitored 24 seven. And we can see exactly both how the bear responds to the tag and then also kind of the fate of what happens to that tag. So at, at Polar Bears International, we're reaching out and trying to use new technologies across all the work we do from education and outreach to our science and conservation efforts. As strong as polar bears are, they definitely need our help to survive in the upcoming decades. And there's so much we can all do both here at home um, and then definitely through support of research uh, like the work we do in the Arctic. Thanks so much. Thank you, that was awesome. And we have people joining us from all over. I saw Puerto Rico and New Orleans um kansas city so 
we've got a lot of people tuning in. So thanks for tuning in. And if you guys have questions, please start asking them. I did see a couple good ones though. Um, so we had a question early on and I know you covered it a little bit, but the question was, what is Burr? And why did you, like, how did we come up with that? Sure, it came up early in the project due to some of the mechanisms that the engineers came up with. And burr comes from burrs you would encounter, at least here in parts of North America, if you're out walking your dog and you get into tall grasses, your dog is likely to find some burrs and those burrs just naturally entangle in fur and hold on. They can be very difficult to get out if you don't get them out quickly. And the engineers use that idea from nature to think how can we tangle something in polar bear for intentionally to hold a tag on. Awesome. So um, another question was they wanted to know, um, I think it was Aubrey, she wanted to know why they were coming into villages um, if you had, if there were specific reasons. Sure, polar bears are very curious. And so as long as polar bears and people have coexisted, we've always had encounters with them as they've come to check us out. And it's something we see out on the sea ice even when we're catching bears. We'll be working on a female in particular and a male bear will come over and say, hey, what's going on over here? So they're highly curious. They're generally unafraid. And now that sea ice is pulling back in more places and leaving bears on shore for longer periods of time, they're also, they also have a little bit more time to get in trouble, right? And so when they smell something that's interesting, and it might not be food, it could be anything that's novel to them, they're likely to come and check it out. So that's that's why they tend to stick their nose into communities where they might get in trouble. Awesome. Okay, I think this question is also for Polar Bears International, um, but I saw a question that asked if you guys have an adopt a polar bear program. If that's, I think you're, this is aimed towards you. <laughs> We do. That's definitely an option. And you can go to our website and check that out. Awesome. So I, I know you hit on it a little bit, um, especially with this project, but um, what do you see? How important is the role of zoos um, as collaborators with researchers to wildlife conservation? Sure. Zoos and our zoo partners play a critical role. If you think about Polar bears specifically, they live in a very remote environment that's expensive to get to, it's difficult to work in, and it can be dangerous for people to be in that cold and especially dark environment uh, through the winter months. So by working with captive bears, we can answer questions we could never answer in the wild. We can look at nutritional issues and energetics uh, by controlling food, changing food, and by taking routine blood samples to see how those things impact the bear's uh, condition overall and health. Um, we've done great studies on polar bear hearing. What can they hear? Um, we're looking at a new study for polar bear sense. What do they smell? What do they like? What do they dislike? You know, we could never do that quantitatively in the wild. And I think one of the, the coolest examples we've seen to date is some of the work done on treadmills and on uh, swimming energetics in captive settings where bears were actually trained, polar bears were trained to walk on these gigantic treadmills. So we could measure how much energy it takes them to walk and to run. That's really cool. Um, I saw another great question from Beth. It says, what can a teenager do to help save polar bears? You can talk to people about climate change. That is one of the most important things all of us can do. Climate change shouldn't be a political issue anywhere. It's just a matter of science. It's a matter of what's going on outside our windows um, where we all live. It's not just uh, something that's impacting the Arctic or polar bears. And as a young person, you can write a letter to your elected representatives, even if you're not voting yet. That doesn't matter. You can get on the phone and call them. You can write them emails from your mayor on up and let them know about your concerns and try to engage them and, and make sure they're keeping an eye on climate issues, both where you live and if they can, up in the Arctic. Awesome, that is great feedback. I saw a question um, asking about our two polar bears at the Kansas City Zoo, so I'll take that one. <laughs> 
So we have two polar bears, a male and a female. We have Berlin, who is 31. And then we have our newest addition to the zoo, uh, Nunik, and he just turned four. Uh, so you can see them every day. They have access to the exhibit. Um, and you know, that, that youngster, he's pretty fun to watch. Okay, I have another question that just popped up. Can you donate to the Kansas City Zoo? You absolutely, absolutely can. We have a couple different options if you're talking specifically about um, conservation and polar bears. We have a, if you go to our conservation link on our zoo's website, there's a donate now to conservation and that money all goes strictly to conservation, that conservation fund I was talking about. So we are funding projects like this to help save polar bears in the wild. So um, if you need more on that, somebody can uh, answer more in detail if you have more questions. But yes, you can just go to our website. It's really easy. Uh, and will Nunick and Berlin have cubs? Uh, they probably not. <laughs> They're not a breeding pair. Um, Berlin is quite elderly. Uh, so they are just kind of hanging out together. Uh, so probably not going to see that from these two. Let's see. We're getting close to our time. Um, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, I was just going to add another quick, easy way, especially for people in Kansas City that aren't really close to anywhere to polar bears. Besides all the great options you gave is, you know, if coming to the zoo is a great option for helping support polar bear conservation, we actually um, give a portion of our tickets and membership um, sales to conservation. So just by visiting the zoo, you're helping save wildlife all over the world. Okay, I am looking to see, there's lots of, I'm trying to follow up with the comments, they're kind of moving up here. Um, I think we might have covered all the questions so far. Let me see. Oh, okay. I see one. Sorry. Way up here. It says, Caitlin wants to know, the panda population has seen improvements in the breeding programs. Do you think the same kind of program is possible with polar bears? I absolutely do. Um, polar bear reproduction in captivity has been a challenge, um, particularly in North America. It's an area of active research. It's another one of those areas where captive facilities working together with researchers who study bears in the wild, collaborating together um, can really help each other out. Um, we're at the stage with polar bears now where we don't need captive breeding, but looking ahead, looking at what's coming, we might, and we definitely wanna be prepared. We wanna be ready and our zoo partners can make that a reality. So we have that on the back burner if needed. Awesome. Okay, and then another one popped up. Where are where are you located for your research? All over. So from Russia to Canada, uh, up to Norway, we go where the bears are. Okay, let me see. With climate change happening where polar bears live, what is being done to help them out? That question's from Gabby. The honest answer is not nearly enough. So we, we're still seeing rapid rises in total greenhouse gas emissions, and we're still seeing rises in temperature that are causing more and more sea ice loss in the Arctic and warmer temperatures everywhere. So we definitely need policymakers at the global level to step up and honor the commitments made at the, the Paris Agreement. The good news for Americans is the US has signed back onto that. Our new U, uh, climate ambassador, John Kerry, is very active. I think having just recently met with China and uh, getting a really good pledge of commitment from them as well. So we have a lot to do to, to bring down greenhouse gas emissions to to transfer to cleaner energy sources. And we just need to put the pedal down and, and keep heading in the right direction. 
Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight and kind of kicking off Earth Week for us. If you out there watching have any more questions, please feel free to drop them in here. Someone from the zoo can get back to you. Um, please visit Polar Bear International's um, website. Uh, and maybe we can drop that in the comments after. I don't know, I'm not that tech savvy, <laughs> but we can definitely get that for you guys. Um, and same thing, come to the zoo, listen to the keeper chats, uh, visit the polar bears. We're always trying to give you guys ways that you can help uh, not only polar bears, other animals all over the world, but we were so, so grateful to have you on and spend time with us. I know you're super busy. Uh, so thank you for all the important work you are doing to help save polar bears. Thanks, Stacia, and thanks to everyone at the Kansas City Zoo for working with us. All right, thank you so much. Everyone have a good night.